Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Florence Alliance Church. Please stand and sing with us this morning.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this, this beautiful day, Lord, and better is one day, Lord, in your, in your house, Lord. So we just, we ask that you uh, fill this place with your presence, Lord. Um, let it be your words that we hear today, Lord. It's you that we come to worship, Lord, and, and we just want to meet you, meet you this morning, Lord. So um, just be with us, speak to us, Lord, and move our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Florence Lions Church. It's great to see so many smiling faces this morning, and uh, we're grateful that you're here to worship with us. And um, last night, uh, I've been told that the church wants to know more about when we do special things in the youth group. So if you didn't know, uh, for those online, I'm Sean. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. And welcome to those online. It's great to have you uh, queuing in and saying hi and uh, in the chat there or just worshiping with us, just to worship with us in the background. So it's great to have you. I pray that the Lord meets you as he meets us here today. So uh, so I heard that people want to know when we do things and what happens. So here I am telling you we did a thing, and I want to tell you what happened. So last night we did bowling. We went bowling from... Uh, 8 to 10 p.m. It was a two-hour deal, and um, we had a lot of fun. We had four regular students and five visitors come last night. So in case you didn't know, that's a really good ratio to regular to visitor. And I'm uh, very, very pleased. And we got to meet some people we never got to meet before last night, so that's great. It was a pleasure. And uh, God has given me a gift of being extroverted, and I would say, and my leaders would know, that a great portion of who we had is quite introverted. And uh, my gift is bringing out the wild and the introverts, and they were wild last night. And it was hilarious to watch them cut loose, throwing bowling balls and giggling with one another. So praise God for a great time. Uh, I do have to give kudos to Kaylin for beating Joel in a game of bowling, so I had to publicly announce that since that was <laughs> publicly done. And then I obviously have to brag about my humble score of 219, and I feel good about that, so thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to our anonymous donor for that evening. Uh, someone in the church decided that they wanted to sponsor the whole night, and it actually was sponsored so well that it was down to like $1 left over and we even bought some food to give to the group because they kept saying, are we gonna have food, are we gonna have food? So we bought food so they would stop asking and so it came down to one dollar left over. So thank you to our sponsor for the evening and praise God for a great turnout and uh, lots and lots of fun and so thank you. So that's our evening uh, for bowling last night. If you would open your um, bulletins, that's what they're called, and you'll see that there is one announcement and it is a big one. This is huge. In the United States of America, across all churches, 2% of people in the church invite someone on any given Sunday. 2% of people invite someone to church on a given Sunday. And I can tell you my youth group is an exception because they invite people every Sunday. And they tell me I invited them, they just said they couldn't come. And then the next Sunday, I invited them. They just said they couldn't come. Then the next Sunday comes, and they have like a flood of group. And Sammy has like four friends that come. And I'm like, holy cow, this is amazing. She is awesome at that. Kaylin has friends that want to come, but they can't. So my group is awesome. So I challenge you to be as awesome as the teenagers. Be as awesome as the teenagers. This is your special event right here, church. Back to Church Sunday, coming September 18th. Yes, sir. So, well, I will repeat that. So, some of us will be here because we're going to have that study and then probably do some setup afterwards. So, uh, so I'm going to repeat that for those that weren't able to hear. So, 
this September 18th event will be in place of the morning, regular morning service. Uh, they will have the normal morning life group, but it'll be an hour later than usual. So 1030, that'll start. And then afterwards, there will be some setup uh, for those that want to come join and help some setup things on that day. And then um, 4.30 p.m., September 18th, we will have a service inside, and then we'll have a uh, meal out on the lawn. Lots of fun things also, I'm sure. And uh, I'm sure I'll have some other weird game out there that we play in youth group, or I'll invent something or find something online that we can all play together as a church. So that'll be a lot of fun, too. Um, so please invite someone. We would love for you to bring at least one person. Did you know that if everybody here brought one person, we would double? <laughs> yeah. That's easy math for you, just so you know. That's dad math. Anything more than that, it's hard. So please bring someone. We, we want you to invite friends. We want you to invite your neighbors. Pray for your neighbors before you invite them. Pray for the people you're going to invite. And then say, Jesus, I'm trusting you with this invitation. Because there's a large percentage of people that said that they would come in a, in a survey if someone invited them. So how often are we inviting people? Are we bugging people enough to go, all right, this person's in front of me again, about to ask me to come to church. That's the point that we need to get to, church. They need to be annoyed by our invitation. We need to annoy them to Jesus. Can you do that? Be like Sean. Annoy people to Jesus, okay? Invite people to this. This is your event, church. Let's do this. So that's my announcement. Uh, if you would, go ahead and tear this connection card off. I like the sound because it lets you know, lets us know that you want to connect with us and let's, you want to give us prayer requests, you want to tell us you were here today. Uh, so go ahead and fill that out and I'm going to invite our reader this morning, Miss Renee McKellogg. And we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 11. <laughs> Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 33 to chapter 12, verse 2. And that's on page 844 in the chair Bibles there if you're, if you're planning to use one of those. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to begin. Miss Renee. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. May God add his blessing to his word. So we are going to look at our mission's focus this morning. Um, I'm going to show a video here in a moment. Before we do that, um, you, have, you, you prayed. I asked you to pray for the beginning of our ESL program, and we had quite a turnout. Um, and this Monday night, um, our classes were full. We, we've got a waiting list now that we're, we're putting people on. And uh, there wasn't one parking space that was available. I had to go out and move my truck and Rosa's car into the grass in order to make space available for those students who were coming. And uh, we, we have just enough for all of them to be here. So we're grateful to God. And uh, you know what an answer to prayer. Thank you for praying. And now we would ask you to continue praying that the Lord of the harvest would 
bring laborers for the harvest field, right? So we, we need laborers to be able to work and receive all of those who would come. Um, maybe next time, you know, there'll be even more who would like to be a part of this. So pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. And we're grateful to God for his answer to prayers. Um, back to church Sunday, we, we mentioned it, the invitations, and I'm going to show a brief video, again, promoting this event, asking for your help. Today's current events can be pretty discouraging, and life can seem pretty hard. On top of that, having to feel like you fault. Uh, that's what happens when I'm not disciplined about the ending time of our discussion below. And, and I'm running late to come up here and don't have time to, to uh, get to all the details. Um, thank you for showing that. And, and there's uh, a challenge to us to invite people. And, uh, you know, Sean laid the gauntlet down. Be like his, the teens in our youth ministry. So that's, there, that's the gauntlet right there, folks. Uh, take up a challenge. All right, we're going to pray, and you see in your bulletin um, information concerning uh, our mission and ministry in Cambodia and also Indonesia, and then our upcoming Back to Church um, Sunday we want to pray about, and so let's bow. Lord, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you, Lord, for extending a call to us and inviting us to Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would invite many others to Jesus, using us as your ambassadors to take the message of reconciliation that Christ came into the world and bore our sins, that we might be delivered, unburdened from that sin, and instead experience and receive the righteousness of Christ. So we give you thanks for this great privilege we have, and we ask God that you would give us that boldness, that faith, uh, in order to um, uh, obey the, the command you gave and to give ourselves to the priority of, of your mission in the world. Lord, we thank you for people in Cambodia and listed for us uh, an, an international work, worker couple, um, learned that the church families in Cambodia are struggling because of uh, the rising prices these days. And so, Lord, we ask for you to meet the needs of people in these villages, and we ask that you would use these two international workers 
uh, to share with them the love of Jesus in tangible ways, demonstrating the compassion of Jesus, and then also giving them opportunities to share the gospel in, in ways that would be clearly understood that you might call these people to yourself as well. So Lord, we ask that you would, in the midst of the needs that are there, use this as an opportunity to glorify the name of Jesus and bring people to faith in him. Father, we want to pray then for the theological schools in Indonesia that are beginning classes and for the many students that, whom you've called into ministry and those who have answered that call by going to uh, a theological school for, for equipping in uh, many different ways. And so, God, we pray for the start to a, a, a good start to the new year for them. We ask, God, for provision for their financial needs, not only for the, the cost of the education, but then for their daily living. We, we pray, Father, for their continued connection with, with uh, churches that they're a part of, Perhaps some of them are even leading and, in, and continue to lead and, and do school also. And so, God, we would, we would hold them before you and we pray that you would help our, the teachers in our schools to walk with you, to follow you, to hear from you, and then to convey the truth of Scripture and what it means to know Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus. We pray you would equip your church in Indonesia with leadership, and that this would result in the multiplication of disciples and churches. Again, we pray for uh, this, this woman that we won't name, but was shared by the breaks when they were here, uh, uh, an, an, a, a national believer that will be is their first missionary sent out to another people group, and we pray for her, ask God that you would bless her and help her. And with over 200 unreached people groups, Lord, we ask that you would raise up workers in that harvest as well and uh, that, that people would be mobilized to go into these various areas and, and to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Lord, we pray for our own faithfulness here. Ask you to help us. Pray that you would um, awaken in us a desire to know the fullness of the spirit that then equips us as witnesses of Jesus uh, here in Jerusalem and then in ever widening circles throughout the world. So Lord, we pray you would glorify yourself and bring many people to know you in Jesus name. Amen. Please stand again and worship with us today.
Psalm 84 is actually where we're going to go in the scripture this morning. If you would turn to Psalm 84, I'm going to read the entire psalm and speak about this. You have an outline in your bulletin that you can follow along with, has some blanks to fill. The title of the message is A Heart Prepared for Worship from Psalm 84. If you're using one of the congregational Bibles, which you can find in the chair in front of you, perhaps, this passage is found at page 844. And I'm going to read from um, the New International Version. It's one of the later editions of it, different even than in some places. Slightly different than, than uh, the one that we have as a congregational Bible, but very easy to follow. So, Psalm 84, a psalm of the sons of Korah, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalm says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on your shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Would you pray with me? Lord, it is our great privilege to be able to come into your presence and worship you, to be given knowledge of your character, your goodness, your greatness, we see it in creation. We especially know it because of redemption in Jesus Christ. But Lord, you are worthy of worship. This is our first duty and privilege to honor you as God, to be grateful to you as the one who has given all good things. What a statement the psalmist makes here. Lord, it's so encouraging to know that there is no good thing that you withhold from those who would walk before you and be blameless. Truly, it is a blessed thing to trust you. In spite of, perhaps, Lord, things that happen around us and to us, yet you are there. You are a rock and a fortress. And so we give you thanks. May you free up our hearts today that we might truly worship and honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. According to Kara Bentley in an article from February 2018, a poll of 2,000 Britons revealed what they thought, those who took this poll, representative of Britons, what they thought a perfect Sunday involved. And it would involve waking up at 8.30 a.m. to the smell of breakfast cooking, followed by three hours of television. A fourth of the Brits polled thought an ideal weekend morning starts with a full English 
breakfast in bed, and a third wanted to start their Sunday morning with a cup of tea or coffee before pottering around the house for an hour. Then later for dinner at 3.15, a perfect roast would be served with ideally four people present. Other activities Brits enjoyed doing on a Sunday included reading a book, listening to music, doing some gardening. Nearly one in ten said they spend their Sunday afternoons at the pub, while one in seven think Sundays are made for doing food shopping to keep the cupboard stocked for the rest of the week. Interestingly, attending church did not appear one time in the answers of those 2,000 Brits. Graham Nichols, who is an evangelical believer from a network of evangelical churches there in Britain, said, I suppose I was sad that attending a gathering of God's people in a church wasn't kind of anywhere on the majority of people's lists. It means that they're not hearing the gospel. They're not coming to an encounter with God. It's also that churches are great places for taking our families, for making friendships, for learning who we are and why we're here. I agree with Mr. Nichols. This is sad. How different it is from the perspective of the one who wrote Psalm 84. Psalm 84 is a song about worship. The exact setting of this psalm is, is not known. Some commentators believe it was written by a person who had been away from Jerusalem in the temple for some time and greatly desired to return there for worship. They surmise then that the psalm was used during the three annual sacred festivals in Israel when it was required for the men to make pilgrimage back to Jerusalem for the feast. But it could just as easily have been written by one who had frequent access to, to the temple and keenly appreciated the privilege of worship. Whether we know the setting or not is not important because what we see in this psalm is the expression of a deep, deep longing for God's house. So if you were to be asked, by a, someone taking a poll, not the question the Britons were asked, but if you were asked about um, your value that, that, that you place on worship, would, would you be closer to the, the far end of the scale represented by the Britons who never mentioned going to worship on Sunday? Or would you be closer to the sentiment expressed by the psalmist in Psalm 84. Those are pretty divergent uh, views of what is important in one's life. I think you would agree with me that worship is a very important activity, perhaps the most important activity. In about three weeks, we're going to invite people to our corporate worship service. We won't do that if we don't place a lot of value on it, on worship. This morning I want to talk about preparing oneself for worship. Preparation is, is necessary, I think, to really enjoy a satisfying worship experience. So let me share with you three components to a more satisfying experience in worship. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is the reason that we go to worship. So the first component towards satisf to, to satisfying worship is to check your motivation. That's the Roman numeral one, the fill in there. Check your motivation. Look at verses one and two. The psalmist says, how lovely is your dwelling place. Lord Almighty, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Remember an older gentleman told me one day that, in, in a former church that I was in, told me that the reason he went to church was because he was 
afraid not to. I guess that ranks, at least in my estimation, as the worst reason for coming to church that I've ever heard. I'm afraid not to. Another common motivation for Sunday worship is often one of duty. I worship because I'm obligated to do so. We are commanded to worship. Therefore, I worship because I have a sense of duty. So check your motivation. If that's all you got, a sense of duty, then by all means, come to corporate worship because you feel you ought to. But that's not the best reason. I think it's a better reason than the previous one uh, where you just did it out of fear. But I believe there are better motivations for worship than duty. You see, when you read the Psalms, when you look at this Psalm, you are supposed to delight in what you worship so that worship is not a mere duty. You're supposed to, to enjoy being in the presence of the Lord. It's, you come because you want to do this, because it reflects the value you place on the object of your worship. It's like celebrating an anniversary with your wife. I've talked about this before. If you're out to dinner after a nice evening and you're out to dinner, she asks you why you've taken her to this nice restaurant for your anniversary. The reason you give better not be, well, it's my duty, it's our anniversary. <laughs> it better be that you delight to be in her presence in that moment. The only response that really honors your wife is that you do this for the joy that it brings you. Well, that's how we also must worship the Lord. Worship is a way of reflecting back to God the radiance of his worth. Look at the motive that is expressed by the psalmist. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. I think he's talking about the, the fixtures at the temple. I, I don't think so. It's because the Lord is there. How lovely is your dwelling place. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. If he could not be there to worship, he would faint. He would want to die. He longs to, to be in the Lord's presence. So he's not coming out of mere duty. This is a deep longing for God that can be satisfied by none but him. His very life seems to hang upon communion with God. The living God is the one thing that he cannot do without in life. Is that your experience of worship? Is that your own heart cry? Throughout the centuries, Christians have discovered a desire for God that burns hot, a love for him that cannot be quenched. Madame Guyon penned these words, still, still without ceasing, I feel it increasing, this fervor of holy desire, and often exclaim, let me die in the flame of a love that can never expire. Frederick William Faber, a hymnist, said, but none honors God like the thirst of desire, nor possesses the heart so completely with him, for it burns the world out with the swift ease of fire and fills life with good works till it runs o'er the brim. Then pray for desire, for love's wistfulest yearning, 
for the beautiful pining of holy desire. Yes, pray for a soul that is ceaselessly burning with the soft, fragrant, fragrant flames of this thrice Well, I, I cut off the, I cut off the, the uh, quote there. Uh, he says the the heart only dwells, truly dwells with its treasure. And the language of love, captive hearts, he writes, can unfetter. And they who love God cannot love Him by measure, for their love is but hunger to love Him, still better. I remember from my childhood, probably before I was even five years old, living in this small town of about 75 people with farms all around, one church building in the, in the town had a belfry. And at 9.15 a.m. on Sunday morning, at, excuse me, at 9 a.m., every Sunday at uh, on Sunday morning, as church service started at 9.15, so at 9 a.m., the bell in the belfry would ring. And I could hear it faintly chime from within my house, calling the townspeople to worship. The psalmist is longing to worship the Lord. And he needed no clatter of bells from the belfry to ring him in. He carried his bell in his own bosom. Holy appetite is a better call to worship than a full chime, wrote Spurgeon. We most honor the Lord when we worship for the joy of his presence. So take note of your own motivations for worship and pray that God would instill in your heart a deep, deep longing for him. Verses 5 through 7 give us a second component that leads toward a satisfying experience of worship. Look at those verses with me as I read them. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. So these verses picture a worshiper who lives a long way from Jerusalem. It has been a while since he has been able to be at the temple, but one of the annual feasts is approaching and he is determined to go. He has set his affairs in order so that he can take the time away. The trip to the temple at Jerusalem could be very arduous. He would have to go south through the valley of Baca. It was arid and desolate. Great hardship awaited him, but that would not deter him in the least as he anticipated the joy of worshiping at the house of God. I want to focus on this phrase in verse 5, the second part of it. When he says, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. He had prepared his heart for worship at Jerusalem. How often do we come into church on Sundays unprepared to worship? The psalmist prepared himself. He set his heart on this. He would allow nothing to distract him from it. Nothing muddled his purpose nor clouded his desire to be in God's house. The second component uh, that leads to uh, satisfied worship is that we must cultivate a worshipful heart. That's the answer there, number two. Cultivate a worshipful heart in verses five and seven. Again, Spurgeon, the blessedness of sacred worship belongs not to half-hearted, listless worshipers, but to those who throw all their energies into it. Neither prayer nor praise nor the hearing of the word will be pleasant or profitable to persons who have left their hearts behind them. 
Now, unlike those in these verses there, 5 through 7, we don't have to prepare ourselves for a worship experience to take place at the end of a long pilgrimage. But it does stand to reason that we also face many distractions and hardships in life and valleys of weeping, which is what Bacha means, valleys of weeping. And we too must set our hearts to worship the Lord. cultivate a worshipful heart. How do you do that? How do you prepare your heart for worship Sunday after Sunday? I would like to offer several exhortations on practical ways to prepare oneself. Let me say that verse 11 says that we should walk uprightly. We should be blameless before the Lord. I'm going to assume that you know that a sinful lifestyle will hinder your worship of God. You won't be prepared if you are not living for him throughout the week. But let me assume that you know that. Therefore, I offer advice to those who are earnestly desiring to worship God in spirit and in truth. For many of the thoughts I offer here, I am indebted to John Piper of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He wasn't talking about worship necessarily, but he was talking about preparation for Sundays in a, in a message uh, on the parable of the sower. But I want to begin the list with prayer. You prepare your heart for worship through prayer. Early Sunday morning, begin by confession of any known sin. Continue your prayer by asking God to enable you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Worship expresses the value you place on God. Loving him with our heart all our heart, soul, mind, and strength not only is the greatest commandment, but it is the way to blessed satisfaction and worship. As you're praying on Sunday morning or throughout the week, but Sunday morning is a good time before you come, pray for the morning service, pray for the music, pray for the prayers, pray for the preaching, pray for a divine encounter, pray for your own attentiveness, fellowship of like-minded believers. Pray that God would be glorified in our midst. Secondly, meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Read portions of your Bible with a view to stirring up hunger for God. Do this Saturday night and Sunday morning. You need to cultivate spiritual taste before you come if you want to enjoy and benefit most from the meal of the Spirit. If you are not sampling the Word of God throughout the week, you probably won't have much of an appetite for it on Sunday morning. If you aren't worshiping God throughout the week, you probably won't have much of an appetite for the worship of the Lord on Sunday morning. You must cultivate this, so meditate on the Word of God. Third, Purify your mind by turning away from worldly entertainment. James 1.21 says, Put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility. Receive the word. Piper writes this, It astonishes me how many Christians watch the same banal, empty, silly, trivial titillating, suggestive, and modest TV shows that most unbelievers watch and then wonder why their spiritual lives are weak and their worship experience is shallow with no intensity. Turn off the television, especially Saturday night, and read something true and great and beautiful and pure and honorable and excellent and worthy of praise. Where do you find that? That was in the previous one. Medit meditate on the Word of God, right? 
But as you do this, watch your heart unshrivel and begin to hunger for God. Number four, forbear with one another without grumbling and criticism. Family squabbles on Sunday morning will ruin your spirit for worship. Now, obviously, parents, you must discipline your children even on Sundays. There may be legitimate disagreements that need to be discussed and worked out between grown adults. But if at all possible, save these discussions for Sunday after worship. Don't get involved in these grumblings and arguments on your way to church. Do your best to be at peace and harmony when you come to church. It will surely help you worship. Number five, when you come to worship, think earnestly about what is sung and prayed and preached. In other words, participate in the corporate worship in appropriate ways. You can't disengage when you come in, find a seat, and the music begins to play, and let's get to the part that I really want to hear or be interested in. No, engage and participate in all of it. This list could go on a long time. Let me just finish with number six again this has to do with priority place high priority on worship place high priority on worship verse 10 better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked this speaks to the high priority that worship held in this psalmist's life. One day spent in corporate worship is 1,000 times of greater value than an ordinary day. All the so-called pleasures experienced through riotous living do not compare to the most mundane moment of the worship service. His priority is on the Lord and his worship. The day we meet together is called the Lord's Day. The day Jesus rose from the dead, the first day of the week. We honor him. It's his day. It's the Lord's Day. But is this day really reserved for the Lord in your heart? Too often it's the activities we have planned after the service that we set our hearts on. They actually are the focus of our affections more so than worship. This is really hard for parents, I think, put in a difficult position because of all the children's activities that occur on Sundays. When a son or daughter has a soccer game or baseball or football or whatever other activity they're involved in on Sunday afternoon, it's hard for them to set their affections on worship. not telling you necessarily to forbid their involvement in Sunday afternoon games. I did not forbid that. I did make them wait till after church to go. But as a parent, you must take great care that, first of all, your priority is on the things of God. You hear that? Take great care that, first of all, your priority is on the things of God. And secondly, Lead your children, teach your children to give first place to the things of God over his or her recreational activities. This will be challenged at every point. So I offer these six items to assist you in preparing your heart for worship week after week. To worship God in spirit and in truth, you must prepare your heart. Cultivate a worshipful heart. So the third component of satisfying worship 
how you promote it, is to keep in mind the goal of worship. Keep in mind the goal of worship, and that is the presence of God. You want to encounter the Lord. This psalm talks about the tabernacle of God, meaning the temple in Jerusalem. It speaks of the outer and inner courts there of the altars. It mentions the house of God. But make no mistake, his yearning was not for the external trappings of the, or the sacred buildings or the rituals, but of an encounter with the living God. Verse 7 says, The pilgrims go to the temple in Jerusalem till each appears before God. Verse 11 says, the Lord bestows favor and honor on those who come. At first glance, that verse appears to mean that the Lord bestows grace and honor among men or, or gives a good reputation to those, but I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. Because the word honor may better be translated glory. It's the Hebrew word used for God's glory. In Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty? The whole earth is full of His glory. It's that word, glory. In the Bible, God's glory doesn't merely refer to His reputation. Rather, it is the very reality of His presence. It is the unified testimony of the Scriptures that God wishes to dwell with men to disclose His reality and splendor to humankind. To those who prepare themselves to worship God, as described in this psalm, he will bestow grace and the reality of his presence, glory. And it is the reality of his presence that makes one day in the courts of God better than a thousand ordinary days. And so this is a psalm about worship. Do you know who is the most in danger of missing out on true worship each Sunday? I think it is me. Because I'm busy with a lot of details and I forget a few occasionally, don't I, Kalen? <laughs> like, hey, I got a video I'd like you to show. I sprung that on him <laughs> right in the middle of this service. <laughs> you did well with it. <laughs> but I got a lot of details, making sure that all the bases are covered so that you can have a positive worship experience with God as far as my responsibilities lie. It is quite possible that in all the preparation I must do for leading worship and preaching and so on, that in all the activity and the doing, I might miss the Lord. So the most important thing for me to do is to prepare myself for worship. I pray for myself. I pray for you. I pray for the presence of God. I pray for those who serve here on Sunday mornings with the different things they do. I commit myself to the Lord. And I pray for his grace that I may have a personal encounter with the living God. If I don't meet Jesus, if you don't meet Jesus, we might as well not gather in the first place. Worship is that important, not as a duty but for the joy of his presence. Because the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. And in his presence is fullness of joy. So let us prepare ourselves weekly and even daily to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. How do we do that? By checking your motivation. Do you have a deep longing for God? You do it by cultivating a worshipful heart. If we don't do that, our attentions will drift. And third, we do it by keeping in mind that the goal of worship is to enjoy the presence of the Lord. May God make us a people upon whom he may bestow his grace and the reality of his presence. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, it is truly a gift that you've given 
that we might join together with the assurance that Jesus will be in our midst. Lord, from the scriptures, we know that the very nature of the church as a community of faith is that of living stones being joined together into a spiritual house of worship. And that your goal for humankind is to dwell with us. Beginning in the garden, expressed in the tabernacle and temple, in the presence of Jesus, in the church, and ultimately in the new heaven and the new earth. Lord, the main feature of all those places is your presence. So God, give us a longing, a longing to be in your presence and lead us to you. A pilgrimage of our life that is always moving towards you and an intimate fellowship with you and your presence. Only your grace can do that. So help us. Amen. Please stand and sing our last song with us.
first priority to worship the Lord. You see how everything else of life flows out of worship? You want to stand clean in his presence, with his character, because we want to know him intimately in worship. We want to be together with God's people because he joins us together as a spiritual house and we experience his presence in ways that we won't when we're by ourselves. And then God's goal is to have people from every tribe, nation, and tongue gathered around the throne, offering up worship, proclaiming the redemption that is given to us in Jesus Christ. Piper, just come to my mind, he has a book called Let the Nations Be Glad, and he says this in that book, that mission exists because worship doesn't. Mission exists because worship doesn't. There are places in the world that do not worship the Lord. Therefore, we are to go into all the world and make disciples so that they can be gathered together in that great band, standing before the throne of God in worship. This is our privilege. Our life is to be a life of worship, and everything else will be caught up in that, and we'll live as disciples of Jesus. So may you go and truly, spirit and in truth, worship the Lord this week.